Hey everyone, before I get into this video, I wanted to address a couple of questions that came up regarding the previous video in the series. The first one being whether or not the Blueprint Thread Safe update animation function is called every tick. I didn't do a good job of clarifying this in that video. It is called every time the animation Blueprint ticks, just like the update animation event that is default or placeable in the animation Blueprint event graph. The second question was a question regarding the potential performance gains that would result from storing the result of the node where we cast to the character movement component in a variable instead of casting every time we call the get character movement function. It's arguable whether or not the performance difference is even noticeable between casting and accessing an object reference when the object that you're casting to is already loaded into memory. Even object References can become quite quickly unperformant when the objects need to be loaded into memory as well. And that's where the soft object pointer types come into play, but that's a topic for a completely different video. In essence, there isn't really a difference, noticeable at least, between casting and accessing an object reference for a object that is loaded into memory. And in the case of the animation blueprint that we are building, it's meant to always run on a character, which is always going to have a character movement component. So we don't ever have to worry about the character and character movement component not being loaded into memory before we make that cast. In some point in the relatively soon future of this channel, I'm planning on putting together a video on animation blueprint optimization and best practices. And I'll go into more depth on the features that Unreal Engine has and the techniques that you can use to get your animation blueprints running more performantly. I'll either release it as a standalone video in the future or find a way to include it as a video in this series and show some practical examples using the locomotion system that we build. With that out of the way, I'll go ahead and roll the video. In this video, I'll guide you through the creation of a basic state machine in our animation blueprints animation graph. By the end of this video, our animation blueprint will have the same idle and walk forward functionality as the third person templates animation blueprint. Though the end result of this video will be fairly simple, I'd encourage you to watch all the way through as I do my best to explain some of the fundamentals of the animation graph and its state machine system, which we will be relying on throughout the series as we create an increasingly more feature complete locomotion system. I'll navigate through the content drawer into the animations folder and open the base animation blueprint that I created in the previous video. Next, I will click into the animation graph, where blueprint nodes have execution pins, anim graph nodes have pose pins. These pose pin connections between anim nodes create a logic flow similar to the execution flow of standard blueprint graph nodes. However, when we place and connect anim graph nodes, pose data is transferred as well. However, when we place and connect animation graph nodes, we do not need to concern ourselves with the conditions that lead to those nodes being evaluated or executed like we do when we place nodes into a standard blueprint graph. We instead only need to consider how the pose data, which is transferred through the pose pins, is affected by the nodes that we are passing pose data into and out of. The anim graph will determine on a frame by frame basis which anim nodes to evaluate based on whether or not they contribute to the final output pose of the graph. The anim graph, however, doesn't exist completely separately from the blueprint graph. While blueprint graph nodes with execution pins cannot be placed into it, Blueprint nodes without execution pins, for the most part, can be. This allows us to call functions, access variables, perform operations on data, and more directly inside of an animation graph. I'll be covering many anim graph specific nodes in this series as we need to make use of them to achieve our desired functionality. A common node that you will use very often is the sequence player node. I'll search for and select one now. This node keeps track of time and outputs each pose for the selected animation sequence asset when it is evaluated. For now, I'll plug this node into this anim graph's output pose. Each frame, because this node is contributing to the output of this graph, it will be evaluated. 
and return the pose from a frame of its assigned animation sequence asset based on its internal state where it keeps track of time. If I select the sequence player, a variety of settings will appear. Some of these are specific to the sequence player node, others to the sequence player and other similar nodes, and then some to most, if not all, anamgraph nodes. Instead of covering all of these settings here and now, I'll cover them as we need to modify and use them to create our locomotion system so that I can provide as much context as I can to their usage and effect. The first setting that we need to modify is the sequence setting, as this sequence player doesn't yet have an assigned animation sequence asset to play. I'll click into the sequence drop-down menu and select the idle animation sequence from the UUS animation set. If you want to learn how to migrate animation assets from one project into another, and assign them to use a compatible skeleton that already exists inside of your target project. A video that explains how to do so is linked in the description and may appear somewhere on the screen now. Additionally, this idle animation is designed to loop, so I'll ensure that the loop animation boolean setting is set to true. Otherwise, the sequence player node will not reset the playtime when the animation finishes, and instead will output the final frame of the animation continuously. If I compile, the preview pose of this animation graph updates. While the preview window is useful as our graphs get more complicated, it will become necessary to test our animation systems through play. Currently, the third person character blueprint is still set to use the Manny animation blueprint that is part of the third person template's content. I'll open up the content drawer and navigate to the third person character blueprint now. I'll open it, select its skeletal mesh component, and change its anim class setting to the ABP underscore base animation blueprint. The animations in the UUS animation set were motion captured on a male and won't look best when played back on a female character without any sort of procedural stance adjustment. I'll go ahead and change this skeletal mesh component's referenced skeletal mesh asset to the mani asset that comes with the third person template content. I'll compile, save, and go back into the level editor and click play. Our base anim blueprint is now being played back on our character, and we can see that the selected idle animation plays back continuously. The next step is to create some logic inside of our animation graph so that we can change states between a idle standing still state and a cycling movement state so that our character doesn't just idle regardless of its movement. Back in the anim graph, I'll right click, search for, and create a new state machine node. It is a very useful and commonly used node in animation systems. We can create states inside of it and define rules for transitioning between them. I'll replace the sequence player node with the state machine and name it locomotion SM. I will double click it to enter its state graph. I'll right click into the graph and here I'm presented with three node options, and one option to add a comment. I will be covering conduits and state aliases later in this series, however the most essential and commonly used state graph node is the state, and it is what I'm going to use in this video. So I'll select the add state option, and name the newly created state idle. I'll repeat the same process, but name the second state cycle. If I double click on the idle state, I'm brought to an animation graph similar to the main one that we previously placed our state machine into. This anim graph is specific to our idle state and will be evaluated when the state machine's idle state is active. I'll place a new sequence player here, connect it to the state's output, and select the same idle animation as before. I'll back out of the idle state and enter into the cycle state. I'll place another sequence player node. This time, I'll search for the jogging forward animation in the UUS animation set. I'll search A underscore N underscore jog underscore loop underscore F and select the top search result. The UUS animation set follows a naming convention structure. And in this case, the A stands for animation the N for neutral stance, the F for forward, and the number at the end states the animation 
angle of motion relative to the camera facing direction on a negative 180 to a positive 180 degree range, with both negative 180 and positive 180 being backwards. Back in the locomotion state machine, I now need to define the transition rules between these states. I'll drag from the edge of the idle state to the cycle state to create a transition. I will do the same in reverse order to create a transition from cycle to idle. This circle along the transition line is clickable, and here inside of it, we can define the condition that the state machine will evaluate while the state that the transition leads out of is active. When this transition's condition returns a value of true, the state machine will transition from the idle state to the cycle state. We want to transition out of the idle state and into our cycling movement state when we know that the player is providing movement input. We can actually determine whether or not the player is providing input along the X or Y axis by running some operations on the character movement components acceleration vector variable. In the character movement components ground movement calculation, velocity is derived from acceleration, which is constrained between zero and a max acceleration float variable setting. The acceleration vector is driven purely by player input. It is not a calculation of velocity over time. When no movement input is provided, the value of the acceleration vector on all axes is set to zero and a breaking deceleration vector is applied with a magnitude determined by another float variable setting inside of the character movement component. The breaking deceleration vector is completely separate from the acceleration vector, which is not an actual representation of velocity over time as it would be in a true physics system. In essence, the magnitude of the acceleration vector is zero when the player is not providing input, and non-zero when the player is. We can use our understanding of the character movement component to set a boolean variable inside of our animation blueprint. It will be false when the character movement component is not receiving movement input, and true when it is. I'll enter into the get acceleration data function that I created in the previous video, and I'll drag the acceleration variable into the graph. I'll multiply it by 1 on the x and y axes and 0 on the z axis, so that any upward acceleration, which would be applied while jumping, is ignored, as we do not want to transition from idle to cycle when we jump, only when the player provides movement input along the horizontal x, y plane. Next, I'll take the result of our multiplication operation and promote it to a variable. I'll name it acceleration2d. I'll need to get that variable and run it through a vector length node, which will return a float that describes the magnitude of the input vector. Next, I'll run that float value into a nearly equal node, which allows us to check if an input value is within a certain threshold of a target value. In this case, that target is zero. I'll raise the threshold slightly. This will nullify any floating point calculation errors that we may encounter through the course of our previous calculations. Right now, this node returns true if acceleration is almost zero. I'll run this result through a not bullying node to invert it. I'll drag out from the not bullying node and select the promote to variable option. I'll name the variable is accelerating, and I'll go ahead and drag both new variables into the acceleration category before I return to the transition role for the idle to cycle transition. I will drag the is accelerating variable into the graph and connect it to the output. I'll back out into the locomotion state machine, enter into the cycle to idle transition, and this time, I'll run the same is accelerating variable through a not boolean node to invert it before connecting it to the output. Back in the state machine graph, I'm going to drag from this entry node and connect it to the idle state. This will make the idle state the default starting state 
for the state machine. Though if a state machine's default state has a transition that is returning true, on the first frame that the state machine is being evaluated, the state machine will enter into that state rather than its default entry state, and this pattern will repeat so that if that state also has a condition which is true, it'll continue to follow that series of transitions and enter into the appropriate state on the first frame. The less work our state has to do, the better, and a character most often will be idling, waiting for movement input when play starts. If I compile, save, and return to the level editor to play, our character idles and runs forward when we move, regardless of direction. In the next video, I'll show you a basic implementation of multi-directional strafing movement within our cycle state. If you have any questions, be sure to ask them in the comments or in the Discord server linked below. I'll answer them as soon as I have time or directly in the next video in the series.